Hey, what's up, guys? This is Ricky V. And today I'm introducing the podcast because we're doing a little something special here. So uh, my buddy Steve is going to be doing an additional episode for you guys every week. It is called Evolutionary hardcore. hardcore. We're just putting this together. Um, my good friend Mobster, incredible, uh, incredible individual. This guy's on the, on the forums a lot, helping people out, knows this stuff. Mobster, he's a competitive athlete. He's the, the real deal. And he's going to be doing the Raw podcast with Steve. It's going to be just quick, right, Steve? That's the format. Really quick fire fitness questions. Yeah, no, yeah. It's um, you know, it's a lot more serious, guys. A lot of information we cover in that one. Um, it's uh, fitness, hundred percent fitness, nothing else. Uh, we don't we don't fuck around on that podcast at all. It's just straight to the point. And a lot of good information. Seventy years of experience between myself and Mobster. So. You guys are going to get a real treat on that one. And um, uh, episode 100 is out or going to be out soon. And, um, you know, you're going to be able to see that. So it's going to be a spinoff of the old. Well, episode uh, 100, we're going to listen to right now after this intro, basically is what we're doing. Okay. So, yeah, so this is going to go in front of the app. I already listened to the episode. Great episode, by the way. And what we're trying to do here, guys, is just give you guys more information every week. You know, we get, we're getting a lot of feedback on, on Facebook, a lot of feedback on the forums from you guys, requesting content, requesting, we talk about things and look, I don't agree with everything. Uh, when it comes, Steve and I don't agree on everything when it comes to steroids and compounds, we have some of the same ideas, but there are things that we have some disagreements on myself and mobster also have some different opinions and it's good for you guys to listen to this information and just get a little bit of a, of a different opinion on, on things. Um, and again, just one more episode per week. So you get an extra four episodes from us per month. It's just more, more information to keep you, uh, keep you entertained and keep you plugged in. You'll get me twice a week with Steve and then Steve once a week with mobster. Correct. Yep. That's, that's our, uh, that's our goal. Yeah. We're, we're still working on editing the, uh, this one's coming up. So you'll be hearing another episode 101 coming up next week after you listen to this one. Perfect. So yeah, so that's it for the intro on Podcast Roy. It, 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 these guys have a different a number sequence with that one. That one is 100, 101. Steve and I are, are up to uh, 300 and change with, with our a version of podcast. And yeah, all in one feed. So you guys uh, can get it, download straight to your phone. We're just giving you more. So hopefully you guys will enjoy it and, and we'll welcome Mobster. He's a very knowledgeable guy, great guy. And without further ado, I'm going to sit back and watch you work, Steve. <laughs> All right, let's hit it. Hit episode 100, come your way. Evolutionary.org presents Evolutionary Hardcore Podcast with your co-hosts, Steve from the American Underground and Mobster from the UK Iron Den. Get ready for the most hardcore and underground info in the industry. And here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5... Four, three, two, one. What's up, guys? Evolutionary Hardcore episode number 100 coming your way. Steve Smee here in Mobster. What's up, buddy? How you doing? Not so bad. Very good. Ready to rock and roll, cowboy. All right. So Mobster's joining us from across the pond. Uh, we took the Concorde direct flight um, across London to... United States, uh, supersonic time. So let's hit this, guys. Uh, the first topic we're going to talk about is SARMs versus steroid. What's better? So, uh, Mobster, I'm going to bring you in on this one first. Um, I kind of talked about this on an episode I did with uh, Nelson Montana on uh, the regular podcast. And um, so I wanted to kind of reiterate that stuff. But what are your thoughts on SARMs versus steroids? If someone wants to come on the forums and they're, whether they're new, or they're a veteran, what's your opinion on making that decision? I, I would say it's a question of results, uh, safety, and what we also sometimes see on the forums is uh, it's a, a way of dipping your toe into the water for a newbie because their, their perception of Psalms is safer as well, of course. Now, Psalms uh, do have some side effects, although they're minimal compared to steroids, so the safety aspect is, is quite high then the results tend to be less. So it's very much a question of uh, safety versus results for me. I would think for myself, my personal choice, uh, 
safety was 100% SARMs first uh, and results 100% steroids first. There's also uh, that potential issue that some people do, which is that they would do a steroid cycle, time off PCT, SARM cycle, time off PCT, steroid cycle. What about you? So I discussed this on our last podcast with Nelson Montana. We had a really good debate on it. And, uh, you know, Nelson's a really real stubborn guy. So it's hard to really uh, convince him of anything. So I wasn't able to convince him. But here's, here's what I found looking at blood work. I've looked at dozens of blood work on SARMs. I've looked at hundreds of blood work with steroids. So when you take SARMs, the interesting thing about them is everybody says they're minimally suppressive. And that's actually true. Um, because I've looked at blood work on it and LH and FSH on SARMs barely goes down. And I've seen blood work where it doesn't even go down on SARMs. So that's really, really fascinating. So that means you're not getting any uh, pituitary gland uh, shutdown. But when you run steroids after maybe a couple weeks on testosterone or any other steroid, maybe besides provirin, if you run provirin alone, but what's going to happen is your LH would drop. If it's at five, it's going to drop to under one in that quickly. So, so it is true that SARMs are way, way, way less suppressive than steroids. But another interesting thing I found, Mobster, is that on SARMs, when it comes to the liver, they are more liver toxic than people realize. They're not as liver toxic as steroids, but there's still some liver toxicity when you're running them. So you really do still need liver support. Yep. I'm just thinking that something that we've seen discussed on the forums, most people are going to use SARMs orally, uh, whether they're in a tablet form or uh, suspended in a liquid. But we have also seen on the forums some suggestion of uh, injectable SARMs. It's not something that we see a lot of on EVO, but we have seen it on EVO. And whether that's an issue in terms of uh, the, the liver values, whether that's a terms an issue with greater suppression, perhaps. So maybe a yeah. topic for the. Yeah, I think that's that's something that we have yet to find out because SARMs. I've only been really studying blood work with SARMs for a couple of years now, so I think over time we'll start learning more. But it's amazing um, because not enough people run blood work. Not enough people run blood work. Not enough people experiment with this stuff. I've run blood work myself. I experimented with this. But a lot of people, like in your situation, you know, if you get blood work, you've got to go through a doctor. So you have, there is a little bureaucracy you have to go through to get it. If I run blood work, I don't have insurance. You know, I have to buy my own blood work, do it all on my own. So in some ways, that makes it more advantageous to me where I can just go get blood work whenever I want. I think something else that we might consider, something that, again regarding SARMs, it came up as a topic uh, and was answered on the forums recently was, we haven't seen any long-term side effects, in spite of the fact that at best guess we're talking about 20 years plus. We haven't seen anybody say that they've had long-term side effects at all. So if there are any side effects, such with the information we have to available to us now and the experience that we have at the minute, we're only seeing maybe the short-term issues that you've discussed and not necessarily think any long-term, whereas with steroids and a certainly long-term use of steroids, we're certainly more likely to see long-term side effects and long-term issues versus SARMs. So you could argue then, SARMs give you some issues, but they're short-term versus long-term for steroids, especially with long-term use of both products. Uh, on the blood test thing here in the UK, it's probably even more difficult for us because I can't go to the doctor and say, listen, I'm using SARMs and steroids. Would you give me a blood test? Nine times out of 10, that's not going to happen. And the cost of the blood test in the UK privately would be something comparable to a little bit under $300. Uh, and, and I'd probably have to go into one of the major cities like Cardiff near me or even as far as London and, and drop into Harley Street. I think Harley Street, I'd be looking at 300 pounds or over 300 dollars, about 320, 330 dollars. So blood tests for Harley Street in the UK, very, very difficult. There is only one or two places I know, and they're privately that would do bodybuilders because they advertise in the bodybuilder magazine here in the UK. And again, I think that's over 200 pounds or about 250, 260 dollars just for a blood test, costing more than the cycle. Well, if you are in the United States, most states will let you just do it on your own. So you guys can hit on the forum, Steve SMI, look at my signature. I do have a link to blood work and I have a link to an article about blood work. Now, the third thing with SARMs too, we talked about the suppression. We talked about the liver. 
Um, but also with SARMs, another thing I've, I've, I've noticed is that with SARMs, cholesterol levels get out of whack with SARMs. Now, again, not as bad as steroids. I've run trend and my total testosterone went from like 140 to 230 on a couple weeks, two, three weeks of trend. So trend is extremely tough on your cholesterol levels. Your cholesterol levels get all of whack. But SARMs also do this. SARMs send your good cholesterol down and your bad cholesterol up. So we do see that with SARMs. It's not as bad. Um, I'll give you an example. With SARMs, your total cholesterol levels would go maybe the 205, 210, which is barely above the 200 uh, level. So it's not anything worth severe. So there are some things with SARMs that um, I've seen people say, oh, SARM doesn't affect your heart health. SARM doesn't affect your cholesterol. But that's not true. Really, any foreign body that goes in, into your body is going to have an effect on cholesterol because your body's reacting to it and your body's trying to clear that toxin. But again, maybe the injectable SARMs, you know, may use a different, you know, um, way of getting into your body. Maybe that would be less. But again, we have to we have to research that more. I would then suggest, and I said, we, it, there's a tendency which we saw with pro hormones when they first come out for people to think that they were somehow safer, and because we, we could still argue that psalms are definitely safer, but we should still treat them with respect, and we shouldn't think that we can do months of psalms. We shouldn't think that there are no side effects, and you've seen me post this many times on the forums regarding the suppressive aspect. That like I said, if, for me, if it's minimally suppressive, it's suppressive and should be treated as suppressive. Whether that means you have to do a mini PCT, with which we've got examples on the forums, uh, whether you need to do a PCT at all because you've had a blood test and it indicates that you do or you do not. You should still treat it as a drug, even if it's a research chemical. You should still think that you're putting hormones into your body will have some effect and you should give it some respect. You don't have to be as scared or afraid of it or treat it in the way, perhaps as a steroid, but you still think, as you said about cholesterol, you should still think about small lesser side effects you should sort of think about short-term effects and look at our articles look at our advice don't stay on, on it for months don't think that you can run psalms for 16 or 18 weeks because you can only run steroids for 12 weeks which is an example and so on Just give it some respect look get your blood test eat healthily it doesn't allow you to get away with eating rubbish it doesn't allow you to do stupid things some steroids do but not all steroids, some psalms will do, but not all psalms. And again, we're talking about psalms in general. We're not talking about specific psalms. We, and we're, also, we're not talking about dosages. We're not talking about some of the guys that might run it at high levels who might have more problems and so on. So we're, we're generalizing when we say these things, but all things being equal, essentially, psalms would be that little bit safer. But by being a little bit safer, we see less of a result. With, with, with one or two exceptions again, and again, that's dose dependent. And it's also, of course, individual dependent, hence the blood test. What I can do, what Steve can do, and what a member of the forum can do, using the same amounts and get, getting different results. That's, that's, we generalize when we say these things. Blood test is the most important thing. If you can get it, especially for the forum members that are based in the States, you can get it because they're able to see exactly what's going on. More than maybe I can, just because of the cost and the difficulty of getting blood tests. But I would treat them with respect. I would treat them like a mild anabolic. I would, I would think in terms of mild anabolic, I would think in terms of mini PCT and keeping an eye on my health. The size and the strength that I am, I still have to do things to keep my cardiovascular health in, in, in place. I still have to be reasonably sensible with my diet and I would do the same with SARMs. I would just treat them as a mild anabolic. Well, I'll tell you this, um, at my peak strength and at my peak weight, it was when I ran Tran and Anabar together and Tran and T-Ball together. Those are two separate cycles. And I was benching, I mean, I'm, all, I'm a small guy. I'm only five, six. I mean, so obviously I can't hold a lot of weight on my body. So um, when I used to compete, I was uh, competing at, at, you know, a very low weight class, obviously, because I was so lean. So I was benching, you know, over 400 pounds. Would I have been able to get to, be, you know, bench over 400 pounds on SARMs? No. I mean, no. it's impossible. No matter how hard I try, I would never. But the flip side is, guess what happened to me when I was benching all that weight? I tore my rotator cuff. Mm -hmm. So would I have torn my rotator cuff if I had just run SARMs and not have been as strong? 
probably not because SARMs do actually have some healing benefits and stuff too, offspring and stuff like that. So there are advantages to both. Will you ever be as strong on SARMs? No. Will you be as at way as much? Would I ever be able to match trend taking SARMs? No, it's impossible, but there are advantages. Plus, I broke up with my girlfriend on trend. Trend is the relationship killer. It, it's, it just mentally makes you feel like, you know, like crazy. So you're going to break up with your girlfriend on trend. You're not going to break up your girlfriend the same way on SARM. So you got to wait. I, it's completely different. It's a complete class of, of things. Maybe we can claim that SARMs are more romantic. <laughs> Great bear for your relationship, guys and girls. I, it's funny, I had a client um, and I warned them about trend. I told them this for like two years and finally he's like, you know what, Steve, I, I want to run trend. So I was like, okay, yeah, man, you have my blessing, you know, run it. And he ends up breaking up with his, with his girlfriend, you know, after it. So he's like, I don't want to run it. I don't want to break up with my girlfriend. And he ended up breaking up. So it's, just, it's a relationship killer. It screws with your dopamine and your mind and everything. So steroids are so much different than SARMs. It's hard to really compare them. Steve's beast trying to take me down the, tr the trend trail because I've never used trend. And, and my best bench press was a little bit higher at 419 pounds just on Suston Deck. And I'm, I figured, oh, maybe I could do 450 or 460. Oh, my gosh. You'd be at 500. <laughs> but you, you, may, you probably tore, tear a couple. You yeah, probably tell. tear your pec in the process. That's the problem with it. You're, yeah. Yeah. You're, uh, tell, the, tell the listeners how old you are, mobster. 55. Huh? 55? I mean, I, I, my my yeah. heavy bench day was today, and this morning I was doing multiple singles with 352 pounds with an aim to getting back towards 370, 380. And it's with a small injury that I, I picked up two weeks ago. I, I don't get at 55. I'm doing very well for my age, 100% very well for my age. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, when if you're, you know, in your 50s and you want to hop on trend and try to hit a, a PR, <laughs> there's a good chance you're going to get injured. I mean, that's just that's just the laws of uh, of nature, so... All right. All right, guys. So our next topic is Anavar only cycle. Is this possible and how? So, um, you know, first off, I don't have a problem with oral only cycles. A lot of guys do. I haven't heard of a legitimate reason why you shouldn't run oral only cycles. There seems to be this belief if you run oral only cycles, you shut yourself down and all this bad stuff happens to you. But the truth is, if you use you know, injectables, you're also shutting yourself down. So I don't really understand the the thing about it. Perhaps the only thing with running Anavar only is you're not getting any androgenic effects because it's a, it's, it's very anabolic. Um, I wouldn't say very, very anabolic, but it's, it's got anabolic, you know, uh, structure to it, but it's not androgenic. So you're not getting an androgenic kick. So example, if you run Anavar by itself and run your cycle, versus running Anavar with test or with trend, you will get much more stronger stacking an androgen with it because you're getting that androgenic kick, but you're also getting more side effects when you do that. So Anavar only is great if you're, if you're a female and you're, you're at a high level, you're competing, um, you're very experienced. Anavar only is great if you're a guy and you just want you know, some, um, to get some fat loss, you want some pumps in the gym, you want some, some lean muscle gains, Anavar only is perfectly fine. Um, you know, we can debate would I run Anavar only compared to T-Ball only. I'd run T-Ball because T-Ball is cheaper and I think you can get the same results on T-Ball. But Anavar is, you know, um, it does have some fat burning properties to it. Um, and that's because it does kind of, uh, affect the way your body, um, you know, affects the thyroid, the binding to the thyroid gland and stuff like that. So there is some structural things about Anavar that give it a little more advantages than running T-Ball itself. Um, so the way I would run it, if you're a female, five to 10 milligrams a day at the most. And then for a male, I'd run it somewhere around 40 to 60 milligrams a day. I don't think you have to exceed 60 milligrams if you're running legit Anavar, not even really 50 milligrams. So how about you, Mobster? You run the Anavar? I, I, I'm a huge fan of Anavar. I did a, a, a short four-week cycle just a few weeks ago. Uh, finished about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. I'm a huge fan of Anavar. I, I ran this recent cycle as low as 30 milligrams a day. The sweet spot, I believe, exactly what you said, is 50 milligrams. We have seen examples on the forums of guys suggesting 100 milligrams, but that's a no. 
uh, the, the, the number one side effect, which people complain about on Anivar, is, is the pumps. Uh, I've, I've 100% suffered with that when I run a 50 milligram cycle with a homebrew uh, version of Anivar some years ago. And I, I remember walking into town and had to stop three times because the pumps in my shins, which you and I have discussed vis-a-vis -vis shin splints, was absolutely awful and had to sit there rubbing, rubbing the fronts of my legs. And, 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 and I got passed by one of the older fellas from the gym who, who was, uh, he, he gave me a little bit of uh, an aside because he was in one of those mobility carts and there's me walking like an old man up the street rubbing my legs because it was so painful. Back pumps as well for some people. We know that Torian can mitigate that. But I'm a huge fan of it. I, I use it for specifically for strength being a strength athlete and, and, in, and that's my particular uh, aim when I lift uh, and for me it gives me about a five maybe somewhere around a 10% it's, it's a great one for adding another five ten kilos to a bar from bench pressing or squatting or whatever else uh, I try not to run it too long uh, and a part of say the 50 milligram for me will give me those painful pumps god knows what that would be like on 60 or 80 and of course as, as we know from the forums again that we've, we've recommended as many many times it seems to be the safest steroid for women to take at around 20, 10 to 20 milligrams a day. Uh, I, I, I don't get lean, but then my diet doesn't change. I typically, for me, I'm thinking of it, when I was on the 50 milligram cycle some years ago, I think I went from about 280 to 285, 290 at the time. And I would lose that when I came back off. But then I wasn't trying to maintain my body weight. It was just adding five or 10 pounds on cycle, dropping it off. Uh, the side effects for me are minimal, apart from those painful pumps. Don't have any issues after the cycle. Would do a, a mild PCT after the cycle. Certainly, I don't, as you know, from conversations on the forums, again, I'm not a big one for running multiple cycles per year. But I think I could probably get away with running two or three cycles of Anavar four to six weeks at a time. And the longest, I've, me personally, especially for competitions, when I've been doing the strength competitions, eight weeks seems to be about perfect for me. Yeah. What you, I... Yeah. Mentioned the I with me um running on Anavar lower back pumps and oh, yeah. those those come in first and then I start getting the lower leg pumps later but by then you're already done so for me if I I can probably get close to a mile if I go for a jog and then that's where the lower back pumps come so if you're if you like cardio you like to go running um, some of you it's summertime for where you guys live so now you know you guys like to go outdoors and go jog running and stuff so or play football or whatnot um not a good idea to to use anavar but one of the things you can do to combat the pumps is taurine so you can get into guard which has taurine in it or you can just get a, a taurine powder and that will help with the pumps but you don't want to just take taurine um for no reason because the pumps can you know you may enjoy the pumps in the gym lifting so really but it becomes if it's crippling if you're lifting in the gym and it becomes crippling like mobster story and it's actually affecting your life, then yeah, you want to run the taurine. And you also run, want to run liver support. You know, it's very important too, because it is toxic on the liver. People think, oh, it's a mild compound, so it's not toxic on the liver. That's wrong. It is, it is toxic on the liver, and we know that from blood work. So you're straining your liver while you're on it, so you don't want to stay on it too long. You strain your liver for a long period of time. It will cause problems. Your liver, just look at your liver as your your uh, pipes that take away sewage from your house. Now, if you block that pipe, then that sewage is gonna run back into your bathroom and you're gonna have a mess on your hands. So that's, that's, that's why you, you need to make sure you're taking liver support that helps you keep that sewage flowing out of your house, out of your body. This way you don't get toxicity in, in your body. Yeah, I was going to say, we, we, we always talk about PCT. I think most guys think of a PCT, regardless of what steroid it is, as a way of recovering our testosterone levels. But in fact, of course, with all hormones from outside of the body, when we're replacing something inside our body, we're, we're, with PCT, we're looking to recover from the kidney. We're really going to recover the kidneys. And Anavar, even as a mild oral steroid, is still being taken orally, it's still going to have that, that potential issue that all seemingly all, all steroids would have so yeah for me pcc isn't just about recovering my testosterone levels which 
being an older athlete, it seemed to take a little bit longer between cycles for me to feel that my, that my test levels are back. But also to allow recovery of the uh, liver and the kidneys and, and, and anything else in my body, not just that. All, all the systems, all the filter systems that are working in my body, let them recover. I think, but I would want to, I would want to confirm this, that for the liver, you're looking for roughly two times the length of time that you're abusing it for you to allow it to recover. So with a PCT, you would be talking to say a four week cycle would require eight weeks for the liver, might be longer. I would want to double check and confirm those numbers, how long it takes for the liver to completely recover after a cycle. It's going to be some period of time and maybe that's how long you need to run a PCT for, more so if you're using an oral steroid, even as mild as what Anavar is. A lot of people have bad livers and you know you can survive you can survive for a while. Liver is very strong. Um, you can survive a while, but if you take other types of drugs, if you drink alcohol, obviously, that takes a toll on your body over time. And the problem with that is that if you're taxing your liver day in, day out, and then you're adding steroids to it, you're going to rapidly decrease your your age. Like Russia, in Russia, you know they. A lot of people in Russia drink. That's the vodka capital of the world. They, they drink hard liquor. That's their thing, East Europe. And we see that. They actually have a drastic uh, lower uh, rate. And also their prison population, they actually, I watched a show on this. They actually interviewed people in prison and they asked them, why are you in here? He said, I did this crime while I was drunk. It was always while I was drunk. So, I mean, we see that in different societies around the, country, uh, around the world where uh, societies that drink a lot of, you know, liver toxic liquors and stuff, they do have a shortened lifespan. And, um, you know, so that's something you really have to, I preach to people don't drink alcohol at all. Um, and that's, that will drastically um, get your lifespan right and keep you, keep you looking young and keep your lifespan much, much more long. Well, I was just going to add, we, when we have these conversations about stories or when the topics come up as a question on, on the forum, people don't consider, you mentioned alcohol, they don't consider any other pharmaceutical drugs that they're taking. Uh, and, and an enormous amount of orally taken pharmaceutically, medically prescribed by a medical doctor drugs, aspirin, ibuprofen, any of the uh, anti-inflammatories, pretty much all the anti-inflammatories have a harsh effect we know on the stomach, and they can. And you can, guys, you need to read the script. You need to read the piece of paper, the insert that comes with these things. An enormous amount of them are having an effect on your body. So you, you're taking a pharmaceutically doctor-prescribed medication, which is having an effect. You're smoking, potentially, which is having an effect, although less of you do now than used to. You're drinking, especially, as you say, in places like Eastern Europe and Russia, and you're having an effect, and then you're worried about the steroidal effect. Well, of course it's having an effect, but you, you, you are ignoring and sometimes negating to, to, to add into consideration all the other lifestyle choices and necess sometimes necessary medications that you're actually taking also having an effect. In other words, you're giving your liver a hammering anyway, just on a, a prescribed medication, and then you throw in a steroid into the mix as well. So you need to consider the, everything you're doing. Not When you ask, and we give you advice, sometimes it's very focused question, like oral using, your oral use of Anavar, but you're not considering the other things that you're doing. You need to consider all of these things. We can tell you to have time off and what we can do, and take and pull out and do guard to help you, but look at everything else you're doing as well. Consider the whole picture, not just one single aspect, especially some of you with particular medical conditions that require regular use of certain drugs. I'm a good example right now with the injury, taking out inflammatories right now to help me with the injury. If I was then using Anavar at exactly the same time, I'm, 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 it's a double whammy. It's, 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 I'm, there's, it's gonna, and it'll take that little bit longer to recover. Stopped Anavar three to four weeks ago, still using anti-inflammatory, still giving my, my liver and my kidneys a little bit of a hammering. Yeah, and in, in the United States, it's, it's different than the rest of the world. We actually take more drugs than the rest of the world combined or some crazy stat like that. So a common, a normal thing for an American is to be on like four or five drugs already. And that's normal because that's what they do. Doctors, they write you, you go to a doctor, they, they write you a script here, 
they make money off writing scripts. They make, they get vacations, they make a commission or whatever. So, yeah. you know, so I had a client that come to me and uh, he wanted to run steroids. I said, okay, what I want from you is run blood works before you even pay me a nickel for a consultation, run blood work. I want to, I want to see your blood work. So he runs blood work and his, his liver values were eight times above normal. So I told him, I'm like, dude, are you on steroids right now? And he's like, no, I swear I'm not on steroids. I've never done steroids. I'm like, dude, what else are you taking? He's like, oh, I'm taking an antidepressant. I'm taking something to help me sleep. I'm taking this. I'm like, I'm, not, I'm like, dude, you realize all that stuff strains your liver, right? And now you want to run orals on top of it, oral steroids. I'm like, dude, you got to get off these drugs. Once you get off these drugs, then we can talk about running steroids. So, you know, it's, it's one of these things. And the doctors don't tell them that, hey, I'm giving, writing you a script for something, and this other doctor gives them a script for something, and they all keep giving them strikes, and now their liver is out of control, and they wonder why they look, a 40-year-old looks like they're 60, because they're taking all these freaking drugs that run their cholesterol and their liver out of control. So I, that, I, yeah, yeah. I was just thinking, you, you, especially with you, with the ones of one consults, and, and the fellas here that I, I coach or or I train with either at the local gym or, or here where I live right now. And one of the things that I've, heard, I've seen happen is that we have to ask sometimes these questions on the forums as well. The guys will tell you what they want, think you need to know, and they won't necessarily tell you what you actually need to know. So when you're doing the one-to-one -one consults, and I have this with the guys here, I know some of these fellas socially, so I know exactly what they're doing outside of the gym. And I've had, I've spoke to people that I've coached or advised in the past and whether it was diet, whether it was training, whether it was drug use, recreational or, or, or performance enhancing, I know that I've had to say, no, 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 you're telling me what you think I want to hear. You're not telling me what I need to know to give you the best advice. So for example, and I'm not going to name names from, from my, from my buddies, I know exactly what the guys are doing outside of the gym. And they can come in here and ask me for advice on this and they can ask me for advice on that. And I go, yes, but you haven't mentioned the, the recreational drug use. You haven't mentioned the fact that I know you use online till one o'clock in the morning. You're staying up late. I know that you're out partying at weekends. So guys, when you're asking us for advice, especially when it comes to the one-to-one -one stuff, the coaching advice, the one-to-one -one consults and whatever else, whether it's pharmaceutical, whether it's recreational, for us to give you the best advice, to us to give you the best re reply online, and one to one, we need to know pretty much everything you could be doing, which to put it crudely, could be fucking you up a little bit or giving you those results. And we can give you better advice, even if it's to come off the pharmaceuticals, if it is to stop the recreationals. And therefore, any response we give you for anabolic or performance enhancers could be that much better, more enhanced, and you're gonna have better results because we was able to give you the right answer based on the right information that you gave us at the beginning. Be honest. So that's what we need to know. That's what your parents for. That's what that's what we're giving out this advice for. And we want we want you to do better. We want you to have better results. We want you to come back on the forum and say, "Mobster and Steve told me something, and I gave him another five pounds, or I put twenty kilos on my bench, or whatever." We want that to happen. So you need to give us all of the information. How many times Steve and I have seen on the forums where you forget to mention your age or your height or your weight, and then we're getting into the pharmaceutical stuff that you're doing the medical stuff, the recreational stuff. Tell us what we need to know so that we can give you the best advice possible. Steve? Yes, uh, so Mobster led us into the, he talked a little bit about PCT. So that, that get, leads us into uh, PCT. Uh, what, you know, let's talk about PCT, efficient PCT. So let me, let me first explain to people um, I talked about this on the other podcast, but I have to keep repeating it. Very, very important information. And the important information is what is the purpose of PCT? And Monster brought it up earlier. He brought up one of the purposes of PCT, but let me, let me talk about the whole purpose of a post-cycle therapy. You run a cycle, you want to do a post-cycle therapy to give yourself a soft laning. Because when you come off steroids, your body shut down, your body's not producing its own hormones. So versus just crashing it'd be like jumping out of a burning building onto the concrete or jumping out of a burning building onto a thick mat at the bottom uh, maybe if you jump on, on the thick mat you may you know twist your ankle or something like that but if you jump onto the concrete you're going to be dead 
So we want to give you a soft landing coming off. So that's the purpose of PCT. The purpose of PCT is not to magically restart your system because you can't do that. If your system is shut down, if you've been on TRT for three years or five years or 10 years, and then you decide, yeah, I'm going to run a PCT and magically fix my HPTA back to normal, it's not going to happen. If that was true, nobody would need to be on TRT in the first place. Unfortunately, you know, if your HPTA is shot, I don't care how much drugs you throw at your system, you're not going to cure it. It's very, very low chance. In fact, we've seen guys on the forums over the years, I know I'm sure you've seen this, who've been like, you know what, I'm, I've been on for five years straight, I'm on steroids, so I'm going to run a PCT and I'm going to recover myself. And then they run a log and then by like the sixth page of their PCT, they log out and they're never heard from again because it failed miserably. They weren't able to, to recover themselves. So, you know, that's, that's the purpose of PCT. You run a cycle, you go do run a good PCT, then you recover. Your body has to recover. But in the meantime, you we run a PCT so we can get a soft landing. So we don't crash after we don't lose motivation. Our gains aren't gone. Every, we don't lose our minds and all that good stuff. Our libido doesn't crash. So N2 generate is very, very important in PCT because what N2 generate does, it's natural herbs. They've been being used for hundreds of years. Um, so it's going to keep your libido strong. It's going to offset those negative side effects from using the, the Clomid, the Novadex. Um, and it's going to, it's actually going to stimulate your pituitary glands and wake them up and stimulate your light cells and wake them up without suppressing you. So it's not something that's hormonal. And the best thing about it is it's illegal. So you can buy like two, three bottles of it and just run five caps a day after your cycle. And if you need another bottle, you can just go and buy another bottle from N2BM or from Amazon. So, you know, it's a great thing to use in PCT. I recommend it to all my clients. If you live in a country where you can't get N2Generate, you really need to just look at the, the label and get all those supplements. And it's gonna cost you hundreds and hundreds of dollars to get all those supplements on their own. So N2Generate saves you a fortune. And N2BM does ship to just about every country. So, Mobster, what's your experience with N2Generate during PCT? I would say but everything you've just said, I would echo completely. I think I've even advised uh, forum members to, to run it after a PCT, just as a testosterone booster in and of itself. And one of the things that I say, and I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier on uh, with regards to the information we've already given, is that you, you, for me, the product that N2Generate is optimizing our own levels so it's literally like putting a good oil into a car that's running a bit rough. You've done, you've, you've got a hundred miles an hour in this car and you've heated the engine up to a crazy level and then you've kept it there for hours. So that no matter what kind of sports car you've got, it doesn't like to be run like that. And that's kind of what you're doing when you want performance enhancing drugs. So you're coming off those drugs. Now you want, you want to, as Steve says, have a soft landing. So you kind of coast back down to a sensible speed, pull over to the side of the road, and pour something in there and give the engine a tweak. That's what you're kind of doing. And you're not gonna run hundred miles an hour for, for some time. So with, with, that's just as an analogy for the body. With engine generate, I've used it after the Anivar cycle recently for a couple of weeks as part of my PCT. And you can certainly run a product like engine generate for quite a while, just as a way of optimizing your hormone output, is specifically testosterone, but other parts of the body, and helping with the recovery and keeping your body tuned, keeping it at peak efficiency, keeping it healthy, and getting it ready not just with a PCD, but getting it ready again for another cycle, getting it having your body optimized uh, hormonally on a variety of aspects, not again just testosterone, as a, as a way of keeping you. And I think I've, I've slightly changing the subject, but. I say to guys, PCT for me isn't just the chemical aspect. It is adapting to the new body mass if I've gained muscle, adapting to being leaner if I've lost if I've lost fat, adapting to being that little bit stronger. I don't expect to keep all my strength after a cycle. I expect to keep some of the new strength. And a product like to generate optimizer more hormones, again, specifically testosterone, is going to enable me, help me, aid me in keeping the strength in keeping the weight off or keeping the weight on depending on what my aims were. So for me, it's, it's a perfect product for that. And as Steve said, if you look at the ingredients, and we had this actually come up on the forum as a topic recently, uh, one of the members was asking about a, a particular a ratio of 
of one of the ingredients and we pointed out no ingredient works on its own the ingredients all works together and if you looked at the amounts and then you took the whole thing and, and read for all the ingredients and looked for optimal amounts individually but n generate works as a product completely with all the ingredients working together to give you that optimization so yes yeah, a fantastic product for that there's very little if anything to compare with it yeah, so I mean that's that that sums it up, guys. And the, so let's let's jump to the next topic as well. We're gonna hit that one in the, in a future episode. It's a really good topic. So next one is GW five hundred one five one six carbarine dangerous. It's a really you know black and it's a black and white question um, that may not require or you know get you a black and white answer. But I'm gonna bring you and Mobster first on this one. What's your take on GW? Have you used it? Uh, because you're you're more of a strong man, and I would imagine when you're doing, you know, a lift, having that extra little ability to kind of push your heart rate more without it, you know, versus a stimulant. If you take a stimulant, your heart rate speeds up, but cartering now actually put allow you to push more without your heart rate going up. So I would imagine pushing out that extra half a rep would be a huge advantage. I'm curious, have you used it, and how does it work? I I would say no. And in fact, I think uh, recommended more for the CrossFit and endurance crowd, even if that is with weights, mm -hmm. rather than the strength stuff, because I'm pausing between reps. I'm taking two to three minutes for the heavier stuff. So I can't see it as being a great advantage for me regarding the safety. Uh, this comes up quite a lot, as, as Steve Smith knows. And we have the whole how much you know, does, does it give you cancer? And you go, no, I think you guys need to go back and look at the original research and Wikipedia, never mind, uh, you could argue that we're biased, but we're not. If you go back and look at Wikipedia and they say, right, okay, what levels were given to the rats and the mice in the test that caused them to have signs for cancer? And it was 200 times the recommended dose. I think, and again, I'm probably, <laughs> I'd have to get a calculator and double check, but it's something stupid like we'd have to have a kilo per day to be able to get some of the, those carcinogenic effects in a human being. We have, and there's no one, I, I don't think we can think of a single example of anybody that we know that's used this product at anything like a crazy level and still hasn't had a side effect that we can think of, uh, certainly in terms of, of the carcinogenic aspects of to it. Mm. Uh, a kilo, a kilo would be two point two pounds, right? Or am I is my math wrong? Right. The recommended dosage is twenty grams a day. It's going to be two hundred times twenty grams, which is the best part of two kilos. So the best part of four point four pounds. I don't think yeah. it'd be. If you took four point four pounds of cocaine in, yeah. in front of you and put <laughs> it on your mouth, you'd yeah. probably die in like two seconds, much less get cancer. Yeah. You know? I don't think it's possible, regardless of what form this GW came in with, it was liquid or a tablet. I can't imagine eating four kilograms of that. And even then, not all the mice and rats, it was some of the mice and rats. So it, it's absolutely crazy. And the guys will go, I read it in a newspaper or I saw an online article. Guys, read more than one paper, read more than one article. Once you do that, and then say, right, I can go, we can go online and look at the original research for this. The same place that the, the, these newspapers and articles have quoted the piece of information from. And then they forget to tell you that it was 200 times the effective dose. So, and we know, Steve will tell you, there are hundreds, if not thousands of forum members on Evo that have taken this product at the recommended dose is almost no need to go above the 20 grams per day or 20 milligrams should i say per day and no one needs to go higher they've all pretty much i would say 90 percent have had great results especially if they've used it properly for for the enhancement of the reps for for the the, the slightly stimulating effect for that cardiovascular boost especially in the endurance athletes at nothing above the recommended dose per day. In fact, arguably, it's very, very cost effective because it's such a low dose product. And uh, yeah, in terms of use it properly, use it as advised, and don't do anything stupid like 200 times a recommended dose is incredibly safe. Uh, you know, you can almost have the mobster guarantee on it. They actually did a study in Australia like about three or four years ago uh, on athletes for six months. They ran it. 
at the correct dose of what we recommend and they check them for tumors or cancer, nothing. And none of the athletes, they tested, I think two or three dozen of them. And they did this study and they ran it for six months. None of them had any signs of any type of tumor growth or nothing. Um, another thing that's interesting too, is if you look at the original, the original, uh, when it was developing carterine, it was actually one of the things they noticed was it actually reduces tumors in the body. And they actually noticed that as something and they were kind of researching, Hey, can we approve this to reduce tumors? So there's some, there's more evidence that actually reduces tumors than causes any type of dangerous issues like cancer or nothing. Yeah. I was just going to add any pharmaceutical company that develops a product of all the Psalms and any pharmaceutical product whatsoever, they have to, I'm pretty sure it's a law, certainly in the States, if not here in the UK, they have to find out what the, the dangerous dose is. And they're required, they have to, they have to look how many people per million would have this and how many hundred thousand would they have that. So they had to probably have a test to see what the most dangerous level was. And they've had that test. They found, you know, the 200 times was where they start to see carcinogenic effects. But they, they, there was no intention on the pharmaceutical call and, and the companies and the people that were developing the product to run it at that level. So it's kind of crazy how gardening got this reputation. They got the, they got the reputation based on them running a test to see what the worst dose was, rather than say, for example, I don't know what, what's aspirin per day: twenty milligrams, thirty milligrams a day to thin the blood. So you don't need to use an ounce, and you don't need to use a thousand grams. But Cardering, for some, for some bizarre reason, picked up this, oh, it gives you cancer. No, they ran the test that they're required to, to prove how dangerous it'd be, what was the worst dose that you could take, as opposed to the most effective and the safest dose. And as Steve Sidney said, if, if I'd like to see more studies, but if he's correct, and I believe that he is, then more studies would prove exactly what we've just said, that low dose, effective dose, which we all pretty much recommend the same amounts, which I believe is 20 milligrams a day, is just about as safe as it's possible to be. You're not gonna use the four kilo example that we gave earlier on. You're not gonna deliberately run it at the most dangerous dose that they had to test for by law. So it, it's just one of those snippets of information that came when the product first came on the market and first started to be used. The media grabbed hold of that one line, one line, and for some reason, it's, it's stuck in people's heads. It's fine because we get to go around correcting that. But it'd be nice if you guys didn't need correcting quite so often. Thank you very much. Well, I think if you go back, when was it abandoned? It was in 2007. Now, if we go back to 2008 Beijing Olympics, almost every Olympic athlete was taking this stuff. Mm. And it wasn't tested. They had no way to test for it. So I believe... It's the same situation as what happened with anabolic steroids. Why did so many anabolic steroids, why did so many pharmaceutical companies abandon anabolic steroids in the United States back in the late 80s? It's because the government started cracking down on it. It's because athletes were doping, using them to dope, and they were basically abusing the system. So it's one of these examples where I believe it's the same thing, like Anavar. We talked about Anavar earlier in the podcast. Why did Anavar disappear in the United States back in the late 90s? Is because the pharmaceutical company didn't want any heat on them anymore because so many people were abusing it. So it, it became illegal to be as it became a schedule three substance. So pharmaceutical companies said, you know what, we don't want to, we don't want to make this anymore. We're, we're out of this industry. We're going to move on to something else that the government, the FDA and the government isn't going to come after us for. We don't want to make the, the government pissed off. So I believe that's the same thing will happen here. So because around the time where every athlete was using that and there was no way to test for it, the pharmaceutical company said, you know what, you know, we're developing this for a medical reason, but 99% of the people who are actually using it are using it for performance related stuff. So we, there's no reason for us to develop it anymore because it's never going to be approved for performance because we can't be cheating in sports. That's the taboo of cheating in sports. We can use drugs for every other thing. Uh, we can use drugs for diabetes. We can use drugs for obesity. We can, use dr we can approve drugs for all these diseases but we can't approve a drug for performance because, oh, cheating, that's, we can't have that. So it's like a, 
It's a really interesting taboo. And I believe that that's not a coincidence that it was pulled in 2007. And then in 2008, magically, every athlete was using it. And then the WADA, just by coincidence, a year later, finally bans it and they add it to the uh, WAD ban list. So I don't think that's a coincidence that those things happen within two years. I was going to add that when it comes to journalistic reports, media reports of certain drugs, especially performance enhancing drugs as used by our athletes and bodybuilders and weightlifters and the like, we're, 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 we're reading their soundbite. We're reading literally two minutes of research on their part. They go onto Google, they, they grab a piece of information. Maybe they read the IOC report. Maybe they read the weather report. But it's that what they probably read was a highlighted press release. They then two minutes of research themselves. They then post this in a newspaper or online, <coughs> media outlets, and then they move on to the next thing. Meanwhile, us in, who are using performance enhancing drugs and know that it's safe because we've done a little bit of research, we've asked for advice, we've got expert opinion, we know that we can speak to buddies that use this product and we can say, have you had side effects? No. We looked at the science. Some of us have quite a good understanding of science. Some of us know, for example, we need to look at well, one study. The, the journalist that might have quoted the IOC and, and, and Wada has moved on to the next story. He, he, he or she is nowhere near this. So you read something that could be a 10-year-old snippet of information online, and it was wrong at the time. It was a soundbite at best. It was a negative piece of publicity. The IOC decides to ban this performance-enhancing drug. That's almost a thumbs up. That's because you know it works. If the safety aspects, we've already, we've already covered that. So not only have you got, yes, it works because they banned it, but we, and we know it works. We can ask our buddies, and we know it works. We can ask forum members, and we know it works. And we know it's safe because we've done more than five minutes of research. In fact, we've stayed with this piece of information for the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years. The journalist that reported it and gave it that negative uh, slant has moved on to the next thing five minutes after the first story. So you, you, you need to come and ask guys like us. You need to come onto the forums and ask us. And we can give you personal experience. We can show you where the research did what it did. We can even show you why they tested it that way. And we can, uh, yeah, if the, if the IOC ban it, I pretty much say that's a golden handshake. That's a golden guarantee that the damn thing works. So, yeah, that's, that's almost a thumbs up for us. Oh, Christ, if they banned it, it's got to be good. Let's see if it's any good. Let's have it. With regards to the safety, that wasn't probably why the IOC banned it. They probably banned it because it was effective. It wasn't banning it for safety reasons because we've covered that. There's no athlete at the Olympics that was using 200 times the recommended dose. They were using it. It was working. They didn't want them to have this advantage. They banned it for that reason. That's a reason why we like it. That's the reason why we think it's effective. And again, just from forum members' experiences alone, I would say it's about a 95%. Yes, I like it. Yes, it made a difference. Yes, it worked. Yes, it, I felt better on it. Do your own research. Don't just take our, our word for it. Do your own research. But you'll see that we're correct. And it means that when, when you come back to us for advice or for answers, how much you can trust what we said because you've done your own research. You've backed up what we said. And it means that when we, when we tell you these things, we're pretty much correct as well. Yeah, really, really good points. Um, all right, guys. So the final topic of this podcast, we're going to talk about Winstrol. So it's a really good question. Uh, this guy wants to know, does Winstrol cause dry joints? So, you know, first of all, let me go over the structure of Winstrol. Um, the Winstrol is basically, it's a, it's a derivative of, you know, hormone. It's an anabolic steroid derivative, just like all steroids. They were derived from the male hormone. And basically what they did is they structured it as a DHT, which is dihydrotestosterone. And that means what they do is they structurally altered it from testosterone to make it unable to aromatize into estrogen. So when you take it, you're basically taking a straight DHT derived compound. Um, and that's because they basically take an A-ring and they replace it with a three keto group. They, they modify it. So all these steroids, guys, over the years, these pharmaceutical companies who've come up with these steroids, they've all modified. They've all, I mean, they've been playing with testosterone since 
World War II, okay, since the 40s. They, 40s and 50s, they were going crazy playing with these, with these um, with male hormones. And they really started studying steroids really earlier than that. I mean, there's evidence that they were studying steroids since, you know, uh, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> you know, they would take uh, hormones from urine and play around with it. So humans have always been curious about hormones. And then, uh, go ahead, Monster, you have a point? I just had a very, very quick history lesson for, for, for our uh, listeners where's the is testosterone I, I did a story on forum the other day and essentially said for example that the romans and the greeks with the early olympic games were eating bulls testicles uh, drinking cow's blood that we know that the zulu warriors were doing the cow's blood thing and and the idea then with some of the scientists and and, and, and the wise men at that time was the idea that you were having a animal's essence which in the case of bull's testicles, we can only begin to think about what the essence might be. But essentially, they were trying to boost athletic performance, even then, as warriors and as athletes. I believe, without looking again, I think Wikipedia refers to testosterone being uh, uh, discovered and then isolated. It was the late 1800s. But as, as you said, I think the, the, both the Americans, the Germans, and the Brits were all experimenting with the super soldier, and not only were they giving them uh, uh, speed as a way of keeping them awake so that they could carry on fighting, they were also dealing, uh, looking at stuff like uh, adrenaline, and again, early forms of testosterone. I think there was, <laughs> I think one of the Wikipedia articles refers to a fellow that was um, isolating testosterone in dogs' testicles and injecting it into himself. I believe that was around the, the, the late 1920s, early 1930s. Rather him than me. I think we're a lot safer now. Thank you very much. But yeah, over, we, we, I think we could say, hand on heart, over 140 years of the study and isolation and study of testosterone. Yeah, that's just, just, just a very quick history lesson for, for the background, how that became to be. Yeah, so I mean, they've been experimenting and, and they came up with the idea with Winstrol, hey, we're going to make something that is completely dry. And um, so you take it and it completely dries you out um, at the cellular level of water. So if you're already lean yeah. and you take Winstrol, I mean, your veins will be popping out. You'll see the striations of your muscles and everything. But one of the bad parts of that is it will dry out your joints. And, and I don't have joint issues. You know, um, if you've got shorter limbs, I've noticed, um, you know, genetically, like Lee Priest, for example, you don't tend to have joint issues um, I, I, overall. But if you have longer limbs, you seem to have joint issues more. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm just reminded of a couple of stories. Uh, the, of the I think Dorian Yates described being so lean that it was actually painful for him to walk backstage at the Olympia because the, the little bit of fat between his bones the tissue and and the soles of his feet the skin was so small that the percentage had got so minimal it was actually uncomfortable for him to walk around in bare feet i, I think there's this idea uh, what we want physically what we how we want to look the being super lean super vascular looking amazing isn't necessarily healthy and if you are manipulating your water if your body fat is incredibly low and then because you've done that with diet You've done it with other forms of manipulation. And then you add in a drug that doesn't pull water in. Like, for example, we know that watery drugs like Dianabol, great for leverage, great for make you feel good, uh, give you that bloat, which is actually kind of good for lifting because of the leverage. You're not going to get that with Winstrol. You, the, the quote unquote dry aspects is kind of chemical rather than literal. But if you're already lean, if you're already died, if you're already conditioned, and then you get the, the boost from Winstrol, it's going to be even less. So any of that little cellular fluid in the muscles and, and around the joints is going to be as least it can possibly be. And you've actually made that. You want that to happen to, in order to look good on stage. But it's not comfortable. And I think some guys kind of want steroids to have to a magical wand effect. I want it to have this effect, but I don't want it to have that effect. You're going to look amazing, but you're not going to feel great. You're going to look amazing, but you're going to feel dry. You're going to look amazing, but it might actually be uncomfortable to do some of the things that you normally do in the gym. Hopefully, especially for competing, that's a temporary thing. It's literally for the day of competition, maybe for a modeling thing, for a few days that you should be in that kind of condition where it's going to be uncomfortable, amazing to look at, but uncomfortable for you to be like that. 
and, and so there's the thing. It's not a long-term thing. You take Winstrol, you shouldn't be uncomfortable weeks and weeks afterwards. Just while you're on it, just while you're ripped, just while your body fat is that low. Your body fat goes up another couple of percent, you decrease the dosage, you're going to have the, the, the good effects that you want coming back. You're still going to look great. For us, of course, we're not looking to look good like on the beach good, although that could be a part of it for you. If you're competing especially, you're looking for something over and above that. For, for the guys that want to look all the good on the beach, you're probably hopefully going to carry a little bit of body fat and a little bit of water. It shouldn't be a problem. But yeah, can it cause dry joints? 100% yes. 100%. But it is condition dependent. You could take it and keep your diet exactly the same and have terrible training and you're probably not going to notice. But if you're ripped, if you're dry, if you're lean, if everything's popping and the veins are coming up, then the wind strolls drying effect will be that much more powerful and that much more uncomfortable. But again, Steve's been in way better condition than me. I haven't been in condition since I was 15. So Steve will know just how great you can look, but equally just how uncomfortable you might be, depending on how rip Steve's got uh, in, to be in condition. Steve? Well, I'll tell you, like, I don't, I've never had joint issues, but running Winstrol, when I would just bend my elbow, I'd notice, oh, you know, something's weird. So I, I would compare it to like running your car with no oil. It's just, there's no lubrication in, in, in your joints. So if you run your car with, with, uh, with no oil, you're going to damage the engine. So, you know, you want to be careful on wind stroll. If you start noticing, you know, Hey, I, I keep, you know, my, it hurts to bend my elbows. It hurts to bend my knees. You're also the hidden joint problems, like in your hips, and a lot of guys, they need help hip replacements when they get older, um, especially those who work in construction and have weight train. I know so many. We used to have JP on the forums, and he had two hip replacements because mm. he used to work in construction and he used to lift weights after work. So it's a double double whammy. So you want to be careful about drying out your – it's not good to have dry joints um, and work out with dry joints for a long period of time. So if you do – if you are preparing for a contest or photos or something, um, you want to look good on the beach, okay, run it, but don't abuse it too bad. And you really should be using joint support supplements. Uh, one of our sponsors, N2BM sells N2 Joint RX. Great product. It's got all the uh, joint help supplements and then also good fats in your diet. Um, American diet, I don't know how it is in Britain, Mobster, but American diet, typical American diet gets zero good fats, zero. Um, and that's not good. So we're just a walking, ticking time bomb for, for joint problems. I'm just going to say that when it comes to, to, to the UK, we tend to have a pattern of following you guys along with certain things, weeks and months and sometimes year after. So we, we look at the American model and we go, oh no, we're better than that. And in six months later, we're not. So for example, you, you, the American, uh, typical American eats out far more, we see that on, on forum members again, far more than we do here in the UK, but uh, the more disposable income we have in the UK, the more like we are to eat out. And, and we know that that comes with all the additives and, and salts and sodiums and, and sugars and whatever else that are added to sauces, never mind the food itself. It's never the same as when you cook it at home. And that, that, that's part of it. Going, going back to the Winstrol thing again, I was just thinking it probably, decreases the the water perhaps in the synovial fluid the, the li liquid the, the 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 oil if you like that lubricates our joints that i believe is also a small tendency to dry out somewhat the tendon the connective tissue so when steve says about using a product like into joint rx which i i use i would also probably throw in some healthy oils in there because although you might be trying to get lean you can still have a small amount of fat in your diet and that helps so yeah drying out of the connective tissue connecting to the, the, the muscle to the bone and decreasing the moisture or, or the fluid content, the, the, the water content, the H2O of the synovial fluid. So the amount of oil that's lubricating our, our joints, elbows, our shoulders, uh, our hips, our knees, our ankles, uh, you're going to notice it then. Another thing which probably applies more to a, a strength athlete like myself uh, on, on, on the joint thing that Steve mentioned earlier on, Right now, I weigh 308 pounds, or to, in English, 22 stone, or about 140 kilos. I'm fortunate because I've been training a very long time and my body's adapted. You guys that are, are, are new or that suddenly add extra body weight, which it can, can include on a drug like Winstrol, 
you're going to notice the difference with the extra mass that you've added. And if you start pounding around the crazy weights, you're going to start smashing on the joints. If you then, as we see some signs with steroid cycles, the guys bulk up and immediately they get bulked. They want to lose weight. So they go from, 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 from a nice wet drug to a nice dry drug because they've suddenly realized they're a little bit fatter when they look in the mirror. They're going to feel the difference. They're going to notice the difference more. They've gone from a watery drug supporting the joints to a dry drug drying out the joints. So if anything, they're probably going to notice it more than, than a guy that didn't do those kind of things. So again, you need to look at that kind of stuff and even ask yourself sometimes why you're doing certain things. I, I, for me, if I was a competitive bodybuilder or a guy that needed to look good for photographs, that I could see me using Winstrol for those reasons for those last short periods of time, the last few weeks of a, of, of a competition cycle. I could see me using it for that so that I could look as popping and as amazing as I possibly could on stage. But I must understand, as I said earlier on, that it will come with the potential for drying out the joints and I'm going to look good, but I might not feel good. If you guys are super ripped and you start to do, you put Winstrow in there, you're going to have to keep an eye on that. Uh, really, with regards to the entry joint or X and maybe it with some krill oil or, or fish oil, something like that, to negate some of the side effects somewhat. But if you're super ripped, if you've got sub 5, sub 3% body fat, you're going to feel uncomfortable uh, no matter what you're doing. So keep that in mind. Oh, all of these drugs, everything we discuss comes with pluses and minuses. The pluses, you're going to look great. You're going to look amazing. The minuses, you're going to feel a bit uncomfortable. I don't believe, and I think Steve could confirm this, it's a long-term thing. I think it's literally just while you're on cycle, just after. And that for most guys, recover completely with regards to dry joints post-cycle. I think maybe there might be a small inherent risk with that, quote, dryness and the drying out of, of the connective tissue. That You might want to keep the doses reasonably low so the, 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 the potential risk of uh, uh, injury, because they're, they're drying out, the because it's maybe lowering the collagen, because it's re reducing the synovial fluid and the fluid around, around the joints, there is probably a greater risk, chance of injury uh, than, than if you wasn't using it. And again, that would be dose dependent on just how crazy you're pounding away in the gym and just how lean you are. We can have this conversation with someone who's ten percent, and it's not that big a deal. But someone that's a five percent, four percent, three percent, it's a much, much bigger deal. And, and most of our members are not going to get that lean, but a few are, and a few women would therefore need to be aware that this is a potential issue. Steve? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely you're going to increase your chance of injury um, mm -hmm. if you're drying out your joints. You could get a little nagging injury. You could you could rub off some cartilage in the process, rub some bones together in the process, and because weight training, you know, um, de lubricates your joints as it is. So I think it's important. I tell guys all the time, maintenance maintenance is very important. Yoga yoga actually will lubricate the joints. So doing some yoga, some stretching, um, really really good. The thing, the nice thing about a yoga class is you're being talked by someone how to do the poses you've got a class that kind of gives you peer pressure versus just stretching by yourself at home um you know it's just not going to be the same so taking a, a yoga class a couple times a week will really help with the joints very very important to do maintenance once you start getting joint problems you know it doesn't get better it's just going to keep getting worse and worse but if you're a young guy you're 20 years old you'll get better um and, and a lot of injuries just get better on their own even though you push through them but once you get older, you, so you get 30, 35, 40, and then your age, mobster. I mean, yeah. that's not the case anymore. I learned that. Um, I, and there's, I, yeah, <laughs> that's the magic. It seems to be the mid 30s, late 30s is the magic age where injuries don't magically cure themselves anymore. You actually, actually have to nurse those injuries. That's why you see pro athletes uh, retire uh, in their early, mid, and if they're lucky, they get to 40. It's very rare where you see a pro athlete get to 40. Tom Brady's 42, 43 and still going, but he's a rare exception. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm of that age now when we're talking to the other older guys in the gym that we, we, we are swapping pain and discomfort kind of stories. And when the younger guys come to the gym, they're like, same as what we were when, when, when I was that age. Goes, oh, we're invincible when, when we're 18. We're invincible when we're 25. We're invincible when we're 30. We're not quite so invincible when we're 35, when we're definitely not invisible 40, 45, 50, and 55. So the, the risk for injuries goes up. The body changes whether we like it or not. The only advantage I have, such as it is, and I have had, of course, injuries, and I've mentioned these injuries on the forums, and, and, and the one I'm carrying right this minute, is 
I'm aware that because I've been training for so long, I forced an adaption of my body. So I'm also uh, uh, aware that I can recover. The injury that I have right now is going to take another two to three weeks, but that's out of a lifetime. And I plan on lifting for a lot longer. And my, my, my body mass supports my joints. So I think my bones have got thicker. My joints are probably harder. I think I, I believe the last time I had an x-ray thing, the conversation came around to bone density. As an athlete, my bone density should be higher. As a lifetime, someone who's been training and lifting for 40 years, my bone density, I would, I would want it to be higher. I'd be annoyed if it wasn't. So I'm lucky in that particular regard. And I never did anything really, really crazy. I've made a few mistakes and recovered. I've had a few injuries and recovered. I've not had any long term. I don't. I got a little bit of tendonitis in the right elbow. I'm dealing with the, the the pain at the base of the neck right now as a result of the stupidity with the 660 pounds Hatfield squat. Um, I don't really have any rotator stuff issue. In fact, going back to the N2 joint RX earlier on uh, with glucosamine and sulfate has been a, a godsend for me as an older athlete. And in fact. Uh, on that particular topic and using product like it to join RX, I, I always say to the, the, the 30 plus athlete, you need to be taking a joint type of product like into joint RX uh, because you will be doing things to your body that the average guy does not do. Uh, you can obviously negotiate those things with safe training, uh, proper form, uh, healthy oils and fats in your diet. And, and glucosamine sulfate and the other ingredients that are into in, in, in into joint RX to support what you're doing and to give you length of time so that you can do 40 years like I have. You can do more than what I have done and still be healthy, still have good joints. So yeah, the, 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 a product, a drug like Winchdog can maybe dry you out, but it's not long term as far as we know. As Steve said, you're more likely to recover as a younger athlete and as an older athlete. So then we throw into joint RX in there. We need, I don't even recommend the guys buy this product. Why, why wait until you get a problem? Why not take something now uh, as a 20-year-old, 25-year-old, and have that there in your diet? And, of course, a healthy diet helps as well. So you, you, the, the glucosamine sulfate, I believe, comes from shellfish. So put some shellfish in your diet. Have, have healthy fish. Help, eat, eat, eat healthy. And that's going to be good. The healthy oils and healthy fats are going to help. But good form helps. Uh, rehabbing. Yoga is a great way of rehabbing and recovering after a workout, as Steve's already mentioned. Hot yoga, that they, I know Steve's a big fan of, is even better for that. Just stretching, guys. I still don't do enough stretching. Shoulder rotator stuff. All of these kind of things help. Wearing sleeves in the right place, keeping your body warm in the gym, not abusing it uh, in, in terms of the physical stuff uh, uh, so that you're not doing crazy things, you're not throwing stuff around, you're not lifting too dynamically. And, and then, you know, these are the, 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 the overall healthy aspects of what we can do. We want to be big, strong, lean, and I'll be crudely a motherfuckers when we're old. Uh, so all the advice that we give you now, it applies to whether you're 20 and it applies to whether you're 50. Take our advice. We're looking out for you guys. And, and a product a to or joint RX is going to help you with that for sure. Steve? Yeah. And, uh, you know, Mobster and I, you know, we've been weight training for a combined, I think, 70 years. Uh, oh, so, so, I mean, uh, we have a lot of wealth of knowledge on this stuff, guys, but we're definitely going to talk more about it. Um, and I agree. I agree totally. That's very important that you should start before you have the problems. I wish I had started in my twenties taking mm -hmm. these joint support supplements, doing an, inv the inversion table every day, um, they're, they're like 120 bucks on Amazon. You can buy an inversion table. It helps with your spine. Um, so it helps stretch out your spine, hot yoga. I wish I had done that. Um, I, I did hot yoga maybe once or twice in my twenties. I should have been doing it at least once a week. I w you know, and that would have helped tremendously in my injuries, but I'll give you an example. Tom Brady tore his ACL when he was 31 years old. Uh, the first game of the season, he tore his ACL. The next year he came back and had a great season. Now he's 43. So in the upcoming season, if he was to tear his ACL week one, guess what? He's not coming back. So just that between being 31 years old and 43 years old is a huge difference um, between your ability to come back from a devastating injury or even a small injury and, ha and, and you getting injured in, in your 40s. So we see it all the time in pro athletes. Unfortunately, you know, our bodies, the wear and tear we put on our bodies does eventually catch up to us. So don't abuse Winstroll. 
um, it's not going to be good for your soft tissue. It's not going to be good for your joints and, and be smart about it. So, all right, let's, let's close up the show. Any final words, uh, mobster? No, no, I think we've covered everything we need to do. Yeah. Let's get so, no. some more Q and A's guys. Send us some more questions in. Let's have some more. Yeah. So, I mean, guys, uh, you know, like I said, 70 years of weightlifting, you're not going to find a podcast with, uh, two guys who have more experience in this stuff. So, Keep the questions coming. We'll talk to you guys next week. We'll have another show for you guys. This is episode number 100, Evolutionary Hardcore Podcast for Steve Smee and Mobster. We will talk to you guys next week. Have a good one. Goodbye.